Hey everybody, it's good to be with you tonight and I trust that you're doing well and staying safe. Uh, we are so much looking forward to Sunday, June the 7th, as we are finally meeting back together in person. It's been a long time since we've been together and it's time. Now we're going to be observing a few guidelines for safety. Uh, Kathy and I shared some of those guidelines with you last night in our video. Uh, you can watch that video at your convenience. Uh, we also have sent out the newsletter for this week, and those guidelines are in the newsletter. You should be re receiving those in the mail in a day or two. Tonight, we want to continue our online Bible study series, The Life of Paul. Tonight is week four of our series, and we want to look at the latter part of Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Ancient Egypt is known for its pyramids, and ancient Greece for its temples, and interestingly, ancient Rome for its roads. Roman roads once covered a total of 53,000 miles, extending through the outermost frontiers of the empire like so many arms from the mother city. They traversed wastelands and forded ravines and crossed over mountains. They were really engineering marvels for the day, and they were enduring reminders of Rome's passion to spread its empire throughout the world. Well, the book of Acts is also patterned with roads to the world, God's roads. <clears throat> but instead of stemming from Rome, his highways rolled out from a place called Jerusalem, carrying the news of Christ to the earth's most distant corners. This passion of God's for road building is revealed in the very first chapter of Acts where Jesus marked the construction plans that the early believers were to follow. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, uh, Jesus, uh, before he ascended into heaven, he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the rest of the book of Acts will trace those words all the way through. In uh, chapters 1 through 7, the roads of witness are paved in Jerusalem. And chapters 8 through 12, they extend through uh, Samaria and Judea. And in chapters 13 through the end of the book of Acts, they course their ways through the far-flung enclaves of the, the ancient world. And today, through, though the writing of the book of Acts has ended, those roads are still expanding into fresh territory as believers continue to clear more paths for the gospel's advance. Uh, we have seen that. Uh, in, in recent weeks, as there has just been an inundation uh, of, uh, uh, of online uh, messages and, and the spreading of the gospel. And, and so we see that even in modern days taking place. How exciting it must be to realize that we can be useful to God just like those early believers were and what a privilege it is to stand in their company. Let's take a moment <coughs> just to review their contributions to the spread of the kingdom of God and recall some of the lessons that they bring us. Now, initially, God's chief engineer was Peter, who stood nose to nose with the Jewish leaders, and he relentlessly proclaimed the gospel throughout Jerusalem. However, for the message of Christ to progress beyond the Jews to the Gentiles, God had to bulldoze through the boulders of prejudice in Peter and in the other Jewish believers. 
And through Peter's encounter with Cornelius, God cleared away these roadblocks and he widened the highway so that all nationalities could come to know Christ. And at the forefront of this new road will be another leader. We've met him before. His name is Saul. Now Saul had been the leading persecutor of the church, but he saw the light literally. While traveling on the road to Damascus, he converted to Christianity. And in Damascus, Saul became a vocal proponent for Christ. And after a few years, he returned to Jerusalem with a fire in his soul for the gospel. But the Jews who were living in Jerusalem, they did not appreciate his newfound faith and his switched loyalties. And so they plotted to kill him. And so the Jerusalem Christians sent him back to his hometown, Tarsus, for his own safety. And although Saul didn't realize it at the time, he would stay there in his hometown, shelved and forgotten for a number of years. With the apostle to the Gentiles sequestered in Tarsus and the other Jewish Christians still a little reluctant to share the gospel beyond Jerusalem, how would God get his word to the remotest part of the earth? Well, the answer to that, believe it or not, is persecution. When Stephen was martyred, a great wave of persecution against the church arose and that scattered believers out of Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. And the prelude of our lesson tonight, this time, picks up on this theme. In Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Now, this scattering would actually be a turning point for Saul. For the persecution that propelled the gospel into Judea and Samaria had begun driving it along the Mediterranean coast to Phoenicia and then to the island of Cyprus and then as far north as Antioch near Tarsus and where Saul was at. Now those persecuted believers who had traveled to 300 miles from Jerusalem up to Antioch, they carried with them the truth of the gospel. It was wonderful, except initially in verse 19 of Acts 11, it says they were preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Now, unaware of the changes God had wrought through Peter's experience with Cornelius, these believers had bottled up the gospel and would only uncork it for God's chosen people. Thankfully, though, not all the scattered saints were so stingy with the, the gospel of Christ. Some of them were more forward-looking, trusting God to show them the new wineskins that he would be poured into. In Acts chapter 11, verse 20, it tells us, But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, Cyprus, of course, was an island in the middle of the, uh, of the Mediterranean. Cyrene was located on the North African coast of what today is known as Libya. And the result of this preaching in Antioch, well, verse 21 tells us, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Through these newborn, multi-ethnic believers, God was unveiling his heart for the world. No longer would Jerusalem and the Jews be his only chosen ones, but he instead would embrace all nations, which is symbolic from the, uh, of the shift to Antioch as the new hub of Christianity. Now this is important. Up until now, 
Jerusalem had been the central location of the church. But now, at this point in the book of Acts, that shift is away from Jerusalem and now to the city of Antioch. And it became the focal point. The apostles remained in Jerusalem, but Antioch was the new hub of the early church. <laughs> now, that must have been a remarkable witness at that time, as the Spirit of God used various evangelists to proclaim with fiery boldness the message of Christ to the Gentiles. Even the Greeks who lived in Antioch were being saved through the preaching of certain men from Cyprus and Cyrene, and news of that revival reached all the way to the believers who were still living in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem believers could have become jealous of Antioch because it was the rising star. But notice how they reacted. Verse 22, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. See, the folks in Jerusalem said, You know what? Let's help them. And so they sent their top man, to Antioch to help out. His name at the time was Barnabas, who was known as the encourager. Now there were other reasons why Barnabas made such a good choice here. Sending a rigid legalistic representative, <laughs> that would have spelled disaster. Barnabas has the right qualifications for the job. He could discern what was happening. Barnabas was also a Jew himself from the island of Cyprus. That meant that he would be viewed not as an outsider, but as one of the group. He knew the culture. Uh, Barnabas knew the language. He knew the mindset. And so he was perfect for that particular job. Barnabas arrived in Antioch. And in verse 23, it tells us when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. That was so characteristic of Barnabas. Uh, Luke even stops to describe his outstanding qualities in verse 24. It says, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. See, like mortar, Barnabas cemented the bond between the churches, and he reinforced the commitment of the new Antioch believers. And because of the encouragement of Barnabas, his hope uh, and his encouragement, the early church pulsated with enthusiasm. Verse 24 continues and says, And a great many people were added to the Lord. Now, let me just point out that these people were not added to the church. They were added to the Lord. See, revival isn't about increasing the membership roles of a church. It's about adding names to the book of life. Admittedly, a local church does grow and it takes shape in Antioch. In fact, it becomes one of the more significant of the, all the churches in the first century. But more importantly, verse 24 says that a great many people were added to the Lord. That's the mark of genuine revival, changed lives. With the surge of new converts in, in Antioch, Barnabas humbly realized that the task was just too great for him alone. And it was then that Barnabas remembered a certain bright and fiery fella that he had lost track of a few years before. Verse 25 says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Uh, now, let me just say that our English translations make this uh, entire process sound easier than the original Greek does. 
it wasn't like Saul was up in the phone book. Uh, you, you know, uh, Barnabas didn't just look Saul up in the phone book, or he didn't Google Saul on the internet to find him. That word seek in verse 25 implies a pretty exhaustive search, and it was long, and it was drawn out. He had to work in order to find poor Saul. It wasn't like Saul was just sitting in Tarsus, his bags packed, sitting by the telephone, waiting to be called up to the big leagues. I get the impression that Barnabas really had to go looking for him. First of all, I think Saul probably had been exiled by his home, uh, from his home by his Jewish family. And the Jewish synagogue had flogged him a number of times and dogged him all over town. And he was probably, believe it or not, he was probably staying in a Gentile home, experiencing Gentile culture and Gentile food. You see, probably four or five years has passed since Saul was sent home from Jerusalem to Tarsus. He's been out of the game for five years. No longer a young man. Saul's probably in his, his mid-40s by now. I'd say he figures everyone has forgotten about him. So what's Saul been up to all these years? Well, I think that he has been studying. I think he's been praying. And I think he's been continuing to allow God to prepare him. I believe all dependence on the flesh is stripped away while Saul is in Tarsus. You know, during this time, I think God revealed some incredible truths to him while he was in his hometown. Do you recall this passage that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2? He said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And then Paul continues a little later in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. In verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, now let's pause here just a second. If you go back 14 years from the time that 2 Corinthians was written, it puts Paul back to the time when he was in Tarsus. Quite possibly, during one of his numerous floggings he received while he was in Tarsus, or maybe in an agonizing battle to survive being stoned, uh, evidently he elapsed into sort of a semi-conscious state. Call it a trance if you want to. But possibly, while in that state of, the, of mind, the Lord, for lack of a better word, transported him into paradise and revealed inexpressible, profound truths to him. You know, I imagine uh, as, as he's going through that, his mind begins to get puffed up, and he's thinking, man, I must be really spiritual for God to show me these things. You know, he didn't show Joe Blow over here. He showed me. And, and so he, it, it would probably have started going to his mind about, you know, I'm, I'm holier than thou because God showed me these deep, deep things that, man, I can't, they're, they're so wonderful I can't even explain them to you. And so in order to knock him down a peg or two, that's when God sent him a thorn in the flesh, just in case he got the big head. And so the thorn in the flesh would keep him humble. Now, I imagine uh, when Barnabas comes to town, one day Saul, he's just minding his own business, and he hears a knock at the door. 
and his hostess answers the door and saw hears a familiar voice from his past. And, and the voice says, they tell me that Saul is staying here. Can I speak to him? And Saul walks to the door and he sees the smiling face of his old friend, Barnabas. Saul's time had finally come. Probably arriving in Antioch like a whirlwind, he taught the people day in and day out. And with Barnabas as his partner and his mentor, Saul was making a comeback. Verse 26 of Acts 11 says, So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. You know, Saul's teaching made a remarkable difference because Saul was different. Under the shadow of the Almighty, he had been humbled. Despite their successes in the church, though, we should not think that ministering in Antioch was easy. Syrian Antioch was a formidable place to begin a ministry. It was third only to Rome and Alexandria and Providence at that time. Known as one of the eyes of Asia, it was the residence of the Roman prefect and the seat of political power for that part of the Roman Empire. Antioch was known for his culture and noted for the commerce since many of the trade routes of Rome uh, passed right through there. Uh, the Roman author Cicero described it as a place of learned men and liberal studies. Well, the culture of this metropolitan city at the mouth of the Orontes River, it was Greek strategically located 15 miles from the Mediterranean Sea, Antioch had become very cosmopolitan. But something else had made the name of the city synonymous with rampant immorality. In this sin city, chariot racing and gambling and debauchery took priority in the persistent pursuit of pleasure. And controlling the ambience was the worship of Daphne, whose temple five miles out of the city housed prostitute priestesses. Apollo's famous pursuit of Daphne and the laurel groves around what became the site of the temple was reenacted night and day by those worshipers and the ritualistic prostitutes. And the phrase, the morals of Daphne, became descriptive through the world of immorality at this time. And so against this dark backdrop, the believers' Christ-likeness became so obvious that their neighbors began calling them a special name or calling them Christians or followers of Christ. As Luke notes at the end of verse 26, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So that term Christian actually was a nickname not taken on by the church, but it was by the world. Those pagan believers named the believers, or, or those pagan non-believers, I should say, they coined the term Christians to refer to the believers living in Antioch. And so the name Christian is really, it's only used in the New Testament one time in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, and again in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. And it was given to the believers by the pagan community, and it probably was originally meant to have a derogatory or a slang usage when it was first given. What a fitting label for these devoted disciples of Jesus. In our day, the real meaning of the word Christian is almost log, uh, lost in the fog of its familiarity. But let's not forget the true meaning of our name. May our relationship to Christ be just as visible as that of the Antioch believers, so that when people see us, they will comment to one another, they must be a Christian. Now, this young church in Antioch 
not only reflected Christ-like character to their own community, but they demonstrated the love of God to other believers as well. The opportunity came in the face of a natural disaster. We're told in verse 27 of Acts chapter 11, And in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So, being concerned about those needy believers living in Jerusalem, uh, living in Judea, the Antioch Christians decided to help them, even before the need became a reality. Verse 29 says, Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the unselfishness of those Antioch believers was remarkable especially considering that the most mature among them was only a few years old in the Lord. And through Barnabas and Saul's ministry, God was maturing them. He was training them quickly. And through all these young Gentile Christians' expression of love towards Jewish believers, the highway of God between the two people were completed, and Barnabas and Saul traveled that road from Antioch to Jerusalem, from the Gentile world to the heart of the the Jewish world, triumphantly returning with the evidence of gospel power in people's lives. As those partners journeyed back to Jerusalem, what must have been going through Saul's mind? Could he foresee the adventures that lay ahead of him, the countless roads that he would travel for the sake of Christ? Did he realize the extent of his calling, the importance of his role as the one who would network the world with the highways of the gospel? You know, Saul's story reminds us that whatever God pursues he accomplishes, and that whomever he chooses, he uses. He may have chosen you to help build his roads and bridges to those to whom he is yet to touch. Now, it may not happen in your time frame. God may keep you sitting on the sidelines waiting until the time is just right, just as he did with Saul. But whatever situation you may be in, you are on the mind of God. And when your hour comes, there's no force in all the world that will resist his power through you. Whatever God pursues, he accomplishes. Now we know this to be true. Yet how we wring our hands and we pace and we fret Will the world crumble while his back is turned? Will a loved one's distress slip his notice? Will his plan for us, with all its good intentions, wither and blow away? Will his answer to our prayers get lost like a mislabeled letter in the mail? Have you ever wondered, can God really accomplish his purposes for me? If so, what areas of your life usually prompt this question. You know, the story of Acts proves, if nothing else, that God can accomplish his purposes. Just think of how God has spread his gospel throughout the world. And he began with just a few ordinary men. You know, those ordinary men were just like you and I. And so, God will accomplish his purposes in us. But we also discover that whomever God chooses, he uses. Now, there's a corollary to this principle. Whomever God chooses, he uses. 
but not always right away. See, God chose Saul at his conversion. Remember, uh, God says, he told Ananias, this is a chosen vessel of mine, a chosen instrument of mine. And God told Ananias to bear my name to before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. God had already told Ananias the great things that, that Saul was going to do. But the Lord did not fully use Saul until many years later when Barnabas came looking for him in Tarsus. Do you feel like God has chosen you for a special purpose, but he's left you waiting in a spiritual Tarsus? Are you struggling with this, you know, anxious for him just to quit stalling and let's get down to business? See, we're all in a hurry. We don't like to miss one panel of a revolving door. Patience comes hard in a hurry-up society, yet it's an essential quality cultivated in only in extended periods of waiting. What we need today is not smarter people, not busier people. A far greater need is deeper people. Deep people will always have a ministry always. And God deepens us through time spent waiting on him. You know, tragically, more often than not, we push at the doors, often with a big old crowbar of self-effort, and we try to break the locks, and we're determined this is God's plan for me. This is what I had in mind. I've waited long enough you know, we, we try to manipulate things and we forcibly step into the scene. <laughs> Been there, haven't you? God doesn't strike you blind, but he sure can make your life miserable. You enjoy no sense of satisfaction. There's also an absence of inner peace. Eventually the pressure gets to you and you'll end up regretting the day that you forced open that closed door. Well, here's a fresh hope in three words. God is able. I know we get weary of waiting. I know it's hard. But waiting is a required course in God's curriculum. Avoid being a dropout of God's school of waiting. Stay there. Just stay right there. Your time is will come. Why don't you pray? We'll pick this up next week. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, for those folks who feel a lot like Saul as he was sort of put on the back burner and forgotten about. That describes so many of us. Help us to see that while it seems that we have been forgotten, that you are moving all the pieces around and putting things in place. Help us to be more like Barnabas, who always found ways to be an encourager to others. Help us, Lord, to have a heart for others and be looking for ways to include the forgotten. Thank you again, Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back on Facebook Live this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. We hope you can join us this Sunday morning. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to be looking at the purpose of the day of Pentecost. You know, God did not send the Holy Spirit just so we could just feel good and say, Woo, wasn't that a good service? No, God poured out his spirit so that we would be witnesses. We were soaked by the spirit so that we could saturate our families and our communities and our world with the gospel. So join us this Sunday as for Pentecost Sunday as we look at being soaked to saturate 
We hope to see you there. And we'll be back, Lord willing, next Wednesday night at 630 with part five of our Life of Paul online Bible study. If you miss any of the lessons or sermons while we're not meeting together, you can check them out on Facebook or you can go to, your, to our brand new YouTube channel and watch those there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God in the search bar and you should find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can actually log in to YouTube using that Gmail account and you can actually subscribe to that channel. That way you receive uh, uh, notices whenever uh, a new sermon is posted. Don't forget June the 7th is our reopening day. We'll be back in-house together for a service, and we're gradually going to work uh, uh, back into a normal schedule over a couple of months, be watching for some safety guidelines as we come back together. So be careful. Stay safe. We miss you. We love you. We'll see you next time. God bless you.